This is the ISG Digital Dish. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Digital Dish. I'm Lois Coatney, and I lead the development of a new collaboration platform. I'm Jeannie Cuff. I implement tools to help customers understand their digital environment. And I'm Julie Fernandez. I work with clients trying to improve all aspects of their HR and people development. We're a group of women who work for a global digital firm, ISG, and we've created a new podcast, Digital Dish, which explores what it means to be a woman in the digital world. Our goal is to create a space for women's voices and experiences in digital. So today, we have an interesting interview with Barbara Guerin from Renown Health. And what I like I, well, what I like about doing interviews anyway is I think it's going to go one way <laughs> and it goes completely a different way. So I thought it was going to be investments and security and tools and automation. It was not that way. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's interesting when security is such a broad topic, but I guess if you think about it, big picture where, you know, whether it be COVID or the fact that, you know, it seems like there's a new hacking thing that seems to be popping up every week. It's almost like, you know, how much do you invest in security? How, how, is there too much money you can invest in it? Is there a kind of a balance between how much money you put into security and what you actually you know, the risk or the mitigation that you're getting out of it is worth the money? I don't know. It's an interesting question. I'd be curious what she's going to say about that, if that's where it went. I don't know. You've got my in interest peak. Yeah. I'm not giving it away because <laughs> it was interesting. And I got to tell you, Jeannie, like I readily identify myself as the least techie of the bunch, right? Because I'm an HR people guy. Um, but I found myself just thinking about this interview and I had to start Googling. I had to start Googling like, you know, I deal a lot with data privacy, especially in payroll related to payroll and HR and all this PII data. And so I thought, well, let me just ground myself on security or, you know, and what exactly are we even talking about? And I hope I have it right because I'm thinking, I'm thinking it's going to be, you know, the things like encryption or tokenization, if there's even, I'm sure there's like whole schools of thoughts about how those things are even different or backups and business continuity, you know, hashing. And so like one Google search led me to another, to another. So I can't wait to hear where this goes, but I was afraid I wasn't going to be techie enough, you know, to, to be able to follow her. So like, Right. That was the thing that I say that I always find out when I do interviews. It goes somewhere interesting and it's not always about as techie as I am. And I am relatively geeky. It does end up being something else. And I don't want to give it away because it's an interesting interview. And Barbara, by the way, is lots of fun to talk to. So, And and in the future, she actually told me the story when we pre-interviewed that they used to, she used to do the cards the uh, for development. She used to write code on those cards and feed the cards into things. So I'm thinking, I need to get a bunch of us old school people together and then talk about, about the coding cards and how you wrote code on cards with punch cards. So, Oh, my gosh. <laughs> That in a podcast, Jeannie, will not make you cool with your 20-year-olds, because that is one of my main objectives in doing these things. It turned me off when I started, honestly. <laughs> All right. Well, enjoy the conversation with uh, Barbara. I think you'll, uh, you'll like it. Awesome. Thank you. <laughs> Today, I'm interviewing Barbara Guerin, who's the Vice President and Chief Information Security Officer at Renown Health. So, Barbara, thanks for joining me. It's my pleasure. So we've been having some interesting conversations. Actually, Barbara and I went through some security issues just to get on the podcast, which is, I think, really of the moment. It's like, how do we continue to connect with all these security concerns? Now, there's a technical aspect to it, which actually I've just gone through with uh, a client who's really struggling with some, uh, got hit with some virus, uh, some phishing. And so that was really bad. But what we want to talk about today is not, I mean, you could talk about it, the technical aspect. Well, let's kind of over, do an overview on, on the technical part of it. So what's your thought on some of the technical challenges that are going on right now? Well, I think uh, the technical challenges are probably not much different even in these crazy post-COVID times than they have been since I got involved in this business decades ago. And that challenge is balancing the need 
for security controls with the need to actually conduct business. Yeah. Um, from a, um, a different perspective, however, I would say that the technical control is keeping up with, or at least close behind the cyber criminals and the technology which they are deploying to wreak havoc um, on us poor unsuspecting victims. Yeah, absolutely. No, and I think that's really gone through the roof. So people are really tightening down and it's doubled because of the issues of us all working remotely. So you have different levels of security for Wi-Fi's and people's modems and things like that. So I think that continues to be a challenge. So uh, from a security perspective, um, you're going to you're hitting even more head on head, aren't you, with the technical challenges and the biz ability to do business? Correct. So, yeah, yeah, that's correct. We were very lucky uh, uh, in my company at Renown Health because when we got that really one day's notice that we were sending everybody home, we had already been working on deploying a virtual private network for remote access because there was just more of a demand for people to be able to work from anywhere. And so when we were all sent home, while a lot of organizations were scrambling, oh my goodness, how do we keep people productive and secure? Right. Uh, we right. were able, we were really able to do that on a dime. Yeah, I, I think that's saying something. I think a lot of the companies who've been a little ahead of the curve on this. Uh, I know my company, we, we all, most all of us work remotely most of the time. So that certainly had made the transition easier for us. And one of the things I was reading about this is a lot of tech projects for transitional projects have been either put on hold or escalated, depending on what they are. Some of the things like security on demand, I think, is getting reviewed. And then the importance of DevOps is certainly part of that discussion. Any other things that you would say that on the technical side that you really highlighted recently? Well, um, sadly, because of the uh, negative impact that uh, COVID has had on not only our financial situation, but I think there are many organizations with the possible exception of financial services. We have had to take a very uh, hard look at our budget and decide which projects, technical or not, can we proceed with and which is, would it be possible to put on hold without jeopardizing our security posture. And so what we have chosen to do is continue to embark on what I call my project to seek out untapped potential with the uh, cornucopia, I will say, of uh, security technologies that we had already made investments in. And to follow up on uh, something I said earlier, uh, I think one of the challenges with technology, and it certainly was a challenge here when I got here the um, a, a little over two years ago, the board was like, what do you mean we're not secure? Look at all of the millions of dollars we spent on technology. And I said, well, owning technology and effectively deploying technology are two different things. And so uh, what I sought to do then before I even started asking for a bunch of money for more technology, more tools, was to seek out the untapped potential in the technology we already owned. And so by doing that with um, our email security tools and our um, identity and access management tools and our firewall technologies and so on and so forth, uh, we have been able to do, I would say, a, a commendable job of improving our security posture without really spending a whole lot more money. Well, and that's saying something because you're in the health area. So I think, I think, you have twice the level of security that most firms have. I think that's that's saying something. I would say as an industry, I agree with you 150%. Why is that? Well, because the cyber criminals can get paid a lot more on the black market for EPHI than they can for any other personally identifiable information which they could steal from anybody else, including PII such as credit card numbers and bank account numbers, which they can steal from financial institutions. Yeah. The fact of the matter is, though, however, that healthcare, the healthcare industry as a whole, still lags behind other industries in terms of our security posture. 
I have been engaged in interesting discourse with our board and with our senior executives uh, exactly on this topic because their question is always, well, how much more do we need to spend? How much more do we need to do? I mean, where do we rate in terms of our industry? And I don't know, I use the analogy of my home. I like my neighbors, but I would like my house to be harder to break into than my neighbor's home. You want a big dog. <laughs> exactly. I want the I want the bigger dog. I want the louder alarm. I want the stronger, uh, whatever those ring doorbell cameras are that people have today. And that's how I feel about our network. Yeah. I rather us be slightly above. There, it doesn't matter where the rest of the industry is. It matters what is our risk tolerance and how willing are we to see our name in the infamous New York Times or how willing are we to pay some humongous fine to the OCR when we have a massive data breach? Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So one of the things that you and I talked about, and I agree, that's that's a huge issue. And I, I was under the impression you had double the uh, <laughs> security. So mm -hmm. that's good to hear. Yeah. So one of the things we talked about is besides the technical challenges, uh, governance is, uh, and, and this is your theme, governance, and, you know, I always look for somebody with a point of view and yours is governance and what the weakest link is. So yep. let's get into that a little bit because I know you could go, this is like, I love a rant. I love a passionate rant. So go. <laughs> <laughs> well, interesting that we should be talking about this on this very day because I had a conversation earlier today about um, outsourcing and my background is actually in outsourcing with a large company before I uh, joined Renown as their CISO two and a half years ago. And a lot of people think that when they outsource, they are outsourcing not just the administration of their network, but they're even outsourcing all of their accountability, all of their liability. Not so. Yeah. Governance wow. is so critical because I recall, for example, with HIPAA, I recall when HIPAA first came out and everybody thought, well, I'll just outsource. And then if there's any kind of a data breach or whatever the case may be, I can just say, uh, no, 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 no regulator. No, you don't talk to me about this. You need to go talk to my managed services provider or some other third party. Well, you know, go talk to the person who handles our vendor management. Go talk to the person who does this, that and the other thing. Well, HHS learned, Health and Human Services learned very quickly, uh, no. And they amended the regulation such that nobody cares who you're outsourcing to. Nobody cares who's managing your third party risk. Nobody cares who's managing your identity um, and access program. You, as the covered entity, entity are 100% responsible for your security. You must have governance programs in place to make sure that those with whom you do business have the same level of control that you would have if you were managing those programs yourself. Governance is critical. You cannot outsource governance. And as far as the weakest link goes, I love that. Wait a minute, because, wait, wait, wait. Hold, hold on, oh. hold on. I want to stop with governance because Please. I agree with that 100%. <laughs> I have seen too many companies who are trying. I mean, God knows they're trying, and I give them full points for that. But you don't just say, here's the problem, throw it over the wall, and let ops handle it. It's like, okay, now it's it's not solving the problem. It's just giving you that support, but you still have to manage that. There Absolutely. still has to be oversight. And I agree with you 100%. And I think you're right. A lot of companies think, oh, because sometimes these deals are made by finance, and they say, okay, we took care of it, throw it over the wall, give it to ops. But ops is like, wait, we got to have a governance structure. We got to have a plan. Yep. So. I'm so glad you said that. So I'm 100% behind you. So go on. What's the next weakest link? So Because I'm, I'm taking notes here. <laughs> so the weakest link. Well, um, goes back to the earlier discussion we had about technology. You can spend millions, and most companies do, including us, and millions of dollars a year on technology. But if all somebody has to do is pick up the phone and say, hello, Jeannie. This is the help desk. We are having a problem with our uh, VPN. Today, we notice it's a little slow. Oh, oh, you're not having that problem? Well, 
why don't you give me your ID and password so I can do a little troubleshooting? And in the event that you do experience this problem, we know you need to be productive from home, I can be proactive and help you fix it. And the user at the end of the line says, oh, oh, I can't have my VPN go down. My ID is, my password is, eh. All the wow. Or if somebody can send the biggest, easy. I always say that cyber criminals, hackers are greedy and lazy. They want the most money for the least amount of work. So phone calls, most people have kind of caught on to the whole phone call thing, but not so much. Right. However, the most effective tool in the cyber criminals arsenal today is phishing. Yep. If they can send an email to someone and fool them into providing credentials, clicking on a link and getting redirected, it's easy, it's cheap. And so what are these two scenarios have in common? Who's the weakest link? It's the human. It's the human at the keyboard. It's the human on the telephone. We have met the enemy and it is us. Oh, wow. So I've heard this. I go through security trainings every month, I think. What do you put in place to help stop that weakest link? Well, you know, I work for a healthcare uh, organization. And um, <laughs> before I uh, got in healthcare, we used to use a joke that now that I'm in healthcare is not so funny, but we used to say, oh, come on, we're not saving lives here. Well, we are but saving are. lives here. And yeah. it could have a tremendous impact on a real human being if somebody slips up, if we get a hacker who manages to attack a network connected medical device, for example, I mean, we could have real impact here. And so, oh, yeah. but, but by the same token, and even though uh, clinicians understand this, they don't see security, information security as something they have any responsibility for. They're saving lives. They're performing surgeries, et cetera, et cetera. They're busy. So, Right. They're busy. So we have had to become very creative in making security something that is interesting, fun, and relevant for all of our end users, including our physicians. And I would say that we've been very successful at that. We have a wonderful cyber information security awareness page on our intranet we actually give out prizes to people as they accumulate points for playing some of the games that we have out there uh, we have a mascot everybody knows sylvester and sylvia the cybersecurity <laughs> sleuths in fact we have had employees who have asked if they could be sylvester or Sylvia, and we take pictures. We actually go around the various healthcare campuses. We take pictures as people dressed up. We, so we, <laughs> we've engaged them. And I would say that um, after about a year and a half of uh, executing on this program, we even have our chief medical officer on board with, oh, wait a second, wait a second, Dr. So-and-so wants to do what? What's the risk? No, uh, no, I'm sorry. The really? risk does not outweigh the convenience that Dr. So-and-so will have. I will tell him no. It's huge win, huge wow, win. Wow, that's huge. Yeah, mm -hmm. because you tend to have the chief medical person be like, I can do what I want to do. And you're like, nope, yep. can't do that. Wow, that's great. What? Okay, I have two really important questions. What are the prizes? And what do Sylvester and Sylvia look like in terms of the mascot? Or, or is it like kind of everybody gets their own envisioning? Of well, the we have the trench coat, oh. we have the hat, and we okay. have the magnifying glass, which we everyone gets to wear. When we first started the program, it was people from my team who dressed up and we took their pictures. We did videos. Heck, I was Sil Sylvia. Um, uh -huh. We even added, somebody asked if their dog could be the four-legged security sleuth. Okay. We said, okay. And as luck would have it, the dog's name was Sasha. So we have Sasha, the, the four-legged security sleuth as well.
So we have a costume and it's our brand. We've, it's our brand. The prizes, you get points and you, we have um, uh, an employee recognition program here that probably a lot of companies uh, have in place where you can trade those points in and choose items from a catalog. And That's so great. we use the enterprise recognition tool and program to, uh, for people to pick out their own prizes. Wow, that's great. I, I love that idea. And, and what you're saying to me is it's been a really successful program. Yes, it has. Yes, it has. And the same thing, you know, while we reward people for good cyber hygiene, we also kind of provide opportunities for those with bad cyber hygiene. So for example, we do with the term rounds, right? Is very common in, in healthcare. Well, we mm -hmm. do security rounds on Fridays and okay. we have people actually walk around and if they notice some bad cyber hygiene, then we provide like them with- post Like a post-it with their ID yeah. and their it on, the, on their monitor that's that's the usual right <laughs> or the people who think that they found a really good hiding place like under the keyboard but that one's kind of you know that one's kind of out there as well so <laughs> we will give them some oh i'll call it just in time or on the spot training likewise when we send out our periodic uh phishing emails mm -hmm. if you click where you're not supposed to click or open an attachment, you get some, not only do you get some just in time, aha, we caught you, here's the clues you that you missed, but right. we also enroll you in a little bit of additional information security training. <laughs> Well, I, I'm really, I'm actually uh, surprised and uh, pretty interested in what you've done. You've taken a creative approach to mm -hmm. information security. Plus, I learned something today about uh, health providers and their challenges, which they definitely have these days. So Yes, they do. Anything else you want to wrap up with? I think that's great. And I appreciate your time, Barbara. Anything else you want to add to this? No, I would just say that um, everyone has read, though, it's so important to, you know, get the, the board engaged and blah, blah, blah. But I would say that is not just a cliche. It really is. We had our CEO and president dress up as um, Sylvester, the cybersecurity sleuth. Um, <laughs> I go to the board now and the, the board, when I uh, got here, we had hundreds of open audit findings. We don't anymore because I present now to the board on uh, progress with audits and uh, you can't really, there's no dollar value that, that you can place on engaging everyone from the, the highest level person in the organization uh, to the lowest. Everybody needs to understand their part in information security. Absolutely. No. And, I, and I'm really glad because I think this is, a, this is a really timely topic. So I appreciate all your time, Barbara, on this. And My pleasure. Thanks. All right. What an interesting interview to listen to. Oh, my goodness. You know, I have to admit, I am not as technical or as geeky as Jeannie likes to say on some of these topics, but this really was eye-opening. I mean, some of the challenges that she talked about in a critical industry and just the amount of work and energy that every day she and her company need to put in to protecting their data and their security is almost overwhelming. Yeah, and a full-time job, right? I mean, if you think about <laughs> think about the little bits and pieces that come in to to our own, you know, areas of domain expertise, like somebody thinks about this all day long. I know, and you know, it started me thinking. I did a little bit of research after you know Barbara was talking about what she does, and it was fascinating to me. But it also got me thinking about what incredibly important role for that's that really women should think about especially women should think about getting into this area i've looked at the bureau of labor statistics in the u.s and they said that the growth of security analysts will grow at least 30 percent it's the fastest growing occupation and it's across so many industries is across certainly IT, but in financial, in um, defense and space, in hospitals and healthcare. I mean, there's just such a wide variety of areas that really anyone who's interested in this type of topic, no matter where they are in their career, it just seems like it's such an incredibly space to get into. 
Yeah, and, and something great for folks that have an analytic mind and like to anticipate, right? What could go wrong or how would I stop, you know, certain behaviors? Kind of that business, anal- you know, that analyst DNA to want to solve things or prevent things is something that uh, can take so many twists, right? I, I bet it's very different for a bank and a financial institution than it is for you know, retail, just totally different problems to solve. Yeah, you know, I was thinking about this and I don't know what kind of programs now, there's probably, I'm guessing, a lot of training on the job that's available. But to your point, the forensics, when I was looking at but some of these roles, they called it forensics where you dive into and gain an understanding of of really trying yourself to be a hacker and figure out where those gaps are and to be able to close them. So it really would be for someone who loves to dive in, problem solve, and really get creative in what they can do. It's, it's certainly an outstanding area to go into. Yeah, you know, you're reminding me of a conversation that came up um, with one of my clients just this week, and I hadn't thought about it until now, but they have a relationship with a SaaS provider, so they have a software provider, and I do an awful lot in the payroll and HR space where there's a lot of sensitive data being passed around, and this company's policies were, you know, included, uh, and I think we're finding this more and more, some hacking tests, right, is part of their uh, vetting their vendors or things, um, hurdles and, and proofs that vendors have to go through to remain a part of the vendor ecosystem include being able to do some hacking simulation, right, and that sort of thing, and I hadn't thought of it before, but it did come up in this client environment that that particular vendor and their SaaS platform, they didn't allow you to do hacking test. You had to go through specifically one of their own partner or an organization that was an authorized, you know, hacking sub. (laughs) (laughs) It was authorized to try to hack them, you know, Um, and that there is a discrete cost to that. And all of those things really fit into what folks are actively doing today, which is saying, hey, I survived Mm -hmm. the change in total change in our business environment. But now I need to be caring for my business continuity. And I need to step back and shore up my business continuity planning and resources and figure out how I can care for my security and my data in a very different environment. Yeah, you know, that's maybe one of those long-term changes that we're going to see or maybe the catalyst, right, with the environment that we're living in this this year with 2020 is business continuity and the planning, not only to put the assurances in, whether it be, like you said, penetration testing or whatever is necessary to proactively stop what could occur, but also how do you, when something does occur, because something probably will occur at some point in time, Mm -hmm. what is your response plan and how is it that you are able to put the workarounds in place to really manage, you know, the impact um, to your business? So, definitely a hot area and something really we should all be thinking about as to when we look and see what we can do. Yeah. And beyond just being the guy that is responsible for cybersecurity, if you're choosing vendors or choosing software, you know, even thinking about these new dimensions as a criteria, or if you're in procurement, you know, understanding exactly how these relationships work and what limitations there are. I don't remember the name of it, but I think they said they had a a ruthless hacker policy. I love it. It's really menacing, you know. I don't think I'd let somebody do that to me either. (laughs) Well, it was, this is an interesting topic. I don't know. We'll have to loop back with Jeannie again. And maybe there's a few things we should really dive into around the security topic ongoing because I don't think it's going away anytime soon. No. And, you know, she ended with something so interesting with Barbara in that interview. And that was around the idea that the weakest link are the humans. Yeah. That's like more decentralized than ever now with us many folks working remote. I'm like, oh, no, I'm the weakest link. (laughs) (laughs) Well, we all, I think, could use a little training now and again, right? Even in our own personal lives, right? As to what we actually bring into our household or sorts of devices that we bring into our household. We're just all going to have to get a lot smarter. Whether we want to or not, we're going to have to get smarter. That's right. Well, thanks to Jeannie and to Barbara for making us a little bit smarter today and giving us all sorts of things to think about in the scary world of cybersecurity. I'm sure we'll pick up on some thoughts about that again in the future. That's right. Well, you have a great weekend. 
see you next time. See ya. Thanks for joining us on ISG Digital Dish. If you like our podcast, subscribe and please rate and review us. Thanks.